Hello, I'm Don Maurice, and welcome to the FDCPA and Estimates of Mortgage Lenders' Costs, brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services blog. We appreciate your taking time to join us today and look forward to presenting you with an informative and timely webinar. Today, it's a pleasure to be joined by uh, my colleagues uh, at the law firm of uh, Maurice Witcher. Uh, we have joining us today from Chicago, Ernest Wagner. Ernest, how are you today? Good, thanks, Don. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Also on the line with us today from sunny, which he had to tell me, by the way, it was nice and sunny there because it's nice and rainy here in New Jersey, is uh, Patrick Tira. Patrick, how are you today? I'm doing great, Don. Looking forward to it. Great, great. So um, you're going to uh, have just a few housekeeping uh, uh, requirements, actually, being, being the attorneys that we are. Um, we always are concerned about uh, giving you some good information and for your questions as well. They're just as important. Uh, you can use the uh, box there to the right of your screen um, to send us a question, and we're going to do our best to answer your question as soon as possible. We may not get to all the questions today. If we don't, that's okay. Uh, we'll do our best to answer them offline. So the legal disclaimer, quite important, because this information is not intended to be used as legal advice. Uh, legal advice needs to be tailored to the specific circumstances of each case. And while we've made every effort to assure the information is up to date, uh, don't take it as a full and exhaustive explanation of the law in any area. And it shouldn't be used to replace the advice of your own counsel. Um, with that in mind, uh, let's talk about the topics uh, that we're going to have today. Um, we're going to look at the estimated fees and, and when they're used as, and, as anticipated fees in foreclosure complaints. That's going to bring us right into the Kmart decision. Uh, then we're going to move on to early communications to borrowers. So we'll look at the examples uh, that are often used and how these estimates of mortgage fees can creep into those early communications, what you should be looking for. Payoff statements, obviously, uh, those are going to be high on the list of where we can see these types of problems. And then reinstatement amounts and reinstatement letters and the other forms of reinstatements that we see. So we're here really today because a recent decision came down from the Third Circuit Court of Appeals which was addressing the use of estimated fees in a mortgage foreclosure complaint. And to tell us more about that mortgage foreclosure complaint, as well as uh, the court's decision and, and further background uh, on it, is Mr. Tira. Patrick, take it away. Thank you, Don. Uh, in Kmark, um, there was a foreclosure complaint that listed uh, attorney's fees and costs inside the body of the complaint. Um, now, these listed fees and costs included both accrued charges and unaccrued estimated charges uh, that were estimated to have been, um, that would be incurred during the lawsuit. Um, the foreclosure complaint did not state uh, that some of the fees were estimated. The borrower sued for violations of the FDCPA, specifically sections 1692E and 1692F. Now, the foreclosure attorneys um, and the mortgagee uh, moved uh, to dismiss the complaint. The trial court granted the uh, foreclosure attorney's motion to dismiss because it concluded that any uh, debtor, even an unsophisticated debtor, would have understood the fees as owed at the end of the lawsuit and there was no misrepresentation there. The trial court also found that whether or not the distinction between estimated fees and incurred fees uh, as with respect to the contract's authorizing language, the difference there was a hyper-technical uh, distinction um, and that the contract's provision for attorney's fees covered both. Now, uh, move, taking a look at the FDCPA provisions that the borrower sued for, uh, 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, section 1692E claims generally involve allegations that a debt collector misrepresented the debt in some way um, and could have um, misrepresented that they could take action that they weren't legally allowed to take um, or just used false and deceptive means uh, to collect on the debt. Meanwhile, Section 1692F claims generally involve allegations that a debt collector collected or attempted to collect a debt that was not authorized by contract or law. Now, the Third Circuit reversed the trial court's order dismissing the complaint. The Third Circuit found that the foreclosure complaint might have violated Section 1692E because it set forth specific amounts due for specific items and did not clearly convey that the disputed fees were estimates or imprecise amounts. And in doing so, the Third Circuit relied on a prior decision, the McLaughlin decision, that said lumping estimated fees and accrued charges together uh, and not clearly communicating what is estimated um, could violate the FDCPA. The Third Circuit also held that the foreclosure complaint might have violated Section 1692F because the mortgage specifically provided that the mortgagee could only charge for services performed in connection with the default or expenses incurred in pursuing authorized remedies. And the Third Circuit emphasized that the operative language there was all past tense uh, in that it services performed or expenses incurred and found that uh, the contract may not have authorized estimated fees. So Patrick, what's going on here, what I, what I see happened here is, is that the trial court renders a decision saying that in this foreclosure complaint, you lumped in some, some costs and fees that hadn't been incurred yet. Uh, in the complaint, though, uh, they appear as a prayer for specific amounts. There's nothing in them that says that they are estimates or that they haven't been incurred yet. Uh, just going back a slide or two. But the trial court says, look, th these are not... Uh, these are not uh, material because uh, any 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 uh, challenge to them could have been asserted, uh, no doubt, in the foreclosure action. And uh, I guess they did not prevent the borrower from asserting any of their rights. And that also that the contract uh, authorizes a servicer to collect attorney's fees and costs anyway. And they focus on this materiality concept. A materiality has been an important defense in the FDCPA now for a couple of years. Uh, it stemmed from a decision in the Ninth Circuit and has uh, been adopted just bef uh, just uh, soon after Kmark. It was adopted by the Third Circuit in a decision, Jensen. Um, and But usually when we talk about materiality, uh, we're talking about a claim that wouldn't on its face mislead or deceive uh, anyone. Um, uh, that representation doesn't imbricate a right that the debtor has uh, under the FDCPA. It doesn't prevent them from disputing a debt, for example. But that's not what the Third Circuit held. What did they hold on materiality, if they held anything at all, Patrick? It didn't address materiality. Uh, it was addressed in the trial court decision, but... In Kmark, the Third Circuit did not uh, address the materiality argument. So, uh, Ernest, before we move on uh, off of Kmark, uh, uh, do you do you do you see anything here going on in this uh, last uh, point that's in this slide here about the the contract only authorizes servicers to charge for service services performed, um, the default and occurred. I mean, they're quoting from the contract. Uh, what, what do you think the court's trying to clearly communicate there? Well, I think, Don, they're trying to uh, forecast uh, for all concerned that 
uh, if the contract doesn't specifically authorize the charge, uh, you're running a huge risk <laughs> by uh, attempting to include it in these uh, charges. I mean, they are narrowly reading, more so than some other cases we'll talk about later. And when you stated in the complaint, and I'm just going to throw out a, a, a round figure because it, uh, it, it makes it easier. When you're stated that, you, that you're seeking attorney's fees of $1,000, uh, you hadn't incurred them. And the contract only allows you to cover, uh, collect those services performed and those expenses incurred. And I think on the E claim to better fit it into E, uh, they, they said, look, those, those disputed fees uh, were not actually incurred, uh, and they were simply imprecise amounts, so they misled a debtor. And I think the, 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 the key here with the materiality, and I think, you know, Patrick, I think this is why the Third Circuit didn't even address it. It's because amounts that are stated in a communication, and this is a complaint, are material when they come to the amount that you're seeking from the debtor particularly and that's exactly what these amounts were seeking so they're not going to be immaterial uh, when they're stated in a complaint one last thing about kmark which is interesting is what kmark confirms is that what's stated in a pleading can also be actionable in the third circuit there's no carve out from FDCPA liability because the representation is contained in a pleading. Uh, we used to have, at least we still have, if it's not an FDCPA case, a litigation privilege. And generally, it would protect an attorney uh, from liability for statements made in pleadings. But a few years ago, uh, the Third Circuit did away with that in a decision called Allen, which also happened to involve uh, a mortgage foreclosure, not a complaint but a, 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 a letter. Uh, but still, uh, they said there's no litigation privilege under the FDCPA. So we've got um, imprecise amounts, and I don't like that either, guys, and I don't know if you picked that up either. Um, they, they didn't, they're talking about imprecise amounts being actionable. So it, it may not have only been that the charges were estimates, but it could have been under this reading of Kmark, that the amounts were not correct and it could have triggered liability. So when charging the fees, when seeking the fees and the costs and whatever, not only is it important, I think under Kmark, to note that uh, these services uh, have not yet been performed or, or not even list them at all, but it's also <clears throat> important to make sure that your foreclosure counsel is getting the amounts right in the complaint to avoid triggering the FDCPA. But let's say, let's say you're dealing now with this question of services performed uh, um, and you've got those. So in my example of $1,000, uh, maybe you have a $100 uh, incurred in fees uh, already, um, but you, you have another 900 uh, that may be coming along um, in the future and certainly uh, you have a complaint where you want to collect not only the $100 that has been incurred today, but the additional $900 that may be coming down the line. Uh, can you plead? Is there a way to plead that with, and avoid Kmark? Well, th there may be done. And, and to drill down further on performed before I before I jump into to, to answer that question, you know, it's important also to remember that when you're dealing with an agreement or a contract, that you make sure you uh, accurately quote the sections of the contract you're relying on uh, in order to include these types of estimates if you want to uh, in complaints or other communications. And, and the reason for that is in Kmark. Uh, we were dealing with uh, sections uh, 14 and 22 of, of the standard uh, Fannie Mae mortgage. And uh, the, in those clauses, it did <laughs> say performed. However, if you look at section 19, for example, as a contrast, there's, there's a little more latitude in the contract uh, that, that allows uh, 
the lender to charge for services that are reasonably required to protect its interests in the property and rights under the agreement. And as we'll see later in the Ilizidi case, that broader language may provide uh, a, a better means to include these types of charges and communications uh, if desired. Although we'll also talk about why you may not want to do that after Kmart. But, but to answer your question about how do we do that, I think uh, if you'll go to the next slide, uh, the, the best way is probably to use what's known as, as the Miller Safe Harbor language. Um, now, uh, Miller uh, involved uh, 1692G, uh, uh, which as you know under 1692GA1 uh, uh, within five days after the initial communication with the consumer in connection with collecting a debt, a debt collect collector must send the consumer a written notice containing the amount of the debt. The borrower a dunning letter that provided uh, the unpaid principal balance of the loan only. The dunning letter stated this amount does not include accrued but unpaid interest, unpaid late charges, escrow advances, and other charges, and went on to say that the amount to reinstate your payoff loan changes daily, and please call us for accurate uh, reinstatement figures. Uh, next slide, please. Now, uh, Miller held that the unpaid principal balance by itself is not the debt. It's only part of the debt. And the FDCPA requires a statement of the amount of the debt in 1692GA1. Um, and this is not satisfied simply by listing uh, a phone number and saying cause. So what do you do then if you want to uh, include uh, future uh, unknown charges in any type of communication? Well, the Miller Court in the Seventh Circuit fashioned uh, some safe harbor language that uh, the Third District and some district courts has followed. And, and the language states this, um, as of the date of this letter, you owe an exact amount. However, because of interest, late charges, and other charges that may vary from day to day, the amount due on the day you may pay may be greater. Thus, if you pay the amount uh, shown above the exact amount, an adjustment may be necessary after we receive your check, in which event we will inform you before depositing the check for collection. And if you have any questions for further information, please call us. So, uh, in order to, to, you know, to answer your question about well, what should we do uh, as far as a communication in the Third Circuit going forward, well, you should include the Miller Safe Harbor language, John. That is the safest, the safest way forward at this point uh, after KMARC. Well, it certainly is, but um, in the context of a complaint, I, I don't know if you can throw in all of the Miller language in the, in the complaint. I mean, you're... I think when you're talking about a, a written communication, and and you, you know you have the payoff statement, you have the uh, you have the reinstatement notice. Uh, this is this is really good language to follow um, because it has been widely adopted. Uh, it's important to note that um, some some courts have held that the failure to disclose that interest is accruing can also be a violation. Uh, of the FDCPA because you're not stating the amount of the debt, for example, and the Miller language captures that uh, as well um, by incorporating that into the safe harbor. I think in the context, though, of the complaint, um, I think what would have, and I want to throw this back at all of you, what would have benefited the law firm would have been, um, and if, if you could do it in, in your pleading, it certainly would be, uh, after Kmark, something you must be doing, is simply have a general demand for attorney's fees. So, you know, uh, say that, uh, the, uh, and I think as, as Ernest pointed out, you want to specify that contract uh, uh, clause that allows for the attorney's fees, but simply say, uh, you know, we seek a principle of X and interest of Y, plus all attorney's fees and other costs which may be permitted under the terms of the contract and, and list those terms. That allows you to capture them uh, 
at the end, um, uh, when you have your judgment, you make the motion for the judgment, the application for the judgment, you could specify at that point the actual fees and costs and, and, and uh, avoid, I think, the problem that the law firm ran into in, in uh, the, the Kmart case uh, where they, they just threw them all of the estimated fees and costs up front. Um, so what's, what's interesting about Kmart is that it's really an old type of claim. This isn't, Kmart is nothing new. Um, Miller was from 2000. It really was talking about the same thing in, in a different way. I'll go back to the slide. And that uh, here, um, the, the, uh, the Dunning letter only gave one amount, but stated that there are other amounts um, that are included, such as accrued and unpaid interest, unpaid uh, late charges, etc., but didn't specify what those are. So it didn't give the proper amount. And that's why um, this Miller uh, safe harbor language uh, uh, you know, squarely addresses, I think, uh, the concerns that we now have um, arising from Kmart. But I also recognize that it's been practice, and it was probably the practice of the law firm uh, who handled the uh, Kmart foreclosure to do this. Um, uh, but uh, unfortunately, that practice has to now change. And at least in the Third Circuit, it has to change. But uh, in the Fourth Circuit, uh, there seems to be something different going on. And Ernest, why don't you tell us uh, what that difference is in the Fourth Circuit? Well, well difference uh, may be an understatement, Don. <laughs> uh, I, I think in the Fourth Circuit, we're dealing with, with arguably the, the exact opposite ruling, although I'll try at the end to... To, to suggest a way it might be reconciled and, and, and maybe a possible way forward in the third. Uh, but, but the Fourth Circuit quite recently just handed down its Ilizidi uh, decision. Now in, in Ilizidi, uh, the debt collector filed a warrant in debt, which is a standardized, standardized pleading available uh, in Virginia State Court to creditors. And in this uh, warrant and debt, sought to collect on the uh, overdrawn account. The uh, warrant sought a specific amount of attorney's fees, but also attached a declaration explaining that this amount included estimated fees. Uh, and so, uh, in, in contrast to uh, the Kmart uh, decision, we have here at least an attempt to demarcate uh, estimated fees from any actual or incurred fees. Uh, as a result of this, the debtor sued uh, the debt collector for violations of 1692 E2 and 1692 F1 of the FDCPA. And as we've uh, mentioned before, 1692 E2 involves uh, the alleged false representation of the character, amount, or legal status of any debt or of any services rendered. Uh, or compensation which may be lawfully received by any debt collector for a debt and 1692 F1 uh, involves uh, in contrast uh, the actual underlying agreement. Uh, next slide please. Now uh, the Fourth Circuit uh, affirmed uh, the dismissal of the uh, debtors FDCPA claims by the District Court. Um, in so finding, uh, Ilizidi uh, did take into account uh, materiality and said that the request for attorney's fees was not misleading because the affidavit attached to the warrant and debt clearly explained that the fees were estimated and as a result uh, found that it was not misleading uh, under 1692E2. Uh, as far as 1692 F1, uh, the court found that the warrant and debt did not attempt to collect on an unauthorized debt because it was proper for the debt collector to estimate an appropriate fee within the limits prescribed by the agreement. Now here's where it gets a little bit interesting though, because the agreement itself uh, did not say that uh, the debt collector was authorized to estimate fees. Instead, all the agreement said was that in the event of a court action to recover a debt, 
uh, the debt collector would be, or excuse me, the debtor would be contractually liable uh, for attorney's fees up to 25% of the amount owed to the bank. And so w when you take into account uh, materiality, when you take into account um, the fact that the, the fees were uh, clearly demarcated between incurred and estimated, I, I think what the, what the court is saying here in the Fourth Circuit is that uh, if you look at the totality of the circumstances, even if the contract doesn't specifically say estimated fees, which would seem to be the magic language, uh, it's okay. Uh, as long as you specifically demarcate what's estimated and what's incurred and there's broad language in the agreement allowing you to collect uh, what you're seeking and that's why I mentioned earlier in the standard uh, Fannie Mae mortgage a clause like paragraph 19 that talks about what's reasonably required to protect the lender's interest as, as somewhat broader language in the language uh, Kmart focused on in the uh, paragraphs 14 and 22, which did say specifically uh, for services performed. So uh, I think that's that's a key contrast between the fourth and the third. Now, as far as what's going to happen in the third, and how do we how do we fight in the future? Well, two things. One, again, the, the safest way forward, as we've talked about, is to use uh, the Miller Safe Harbor language, but um, you know, we have a look back uh, of about a year from uh, the date of uh, the decision in the third where you might have some uh, claims out there. There's nothing you can do about it. It's already happened. So uh, when you get your good counsel to help you with these fights, which, which may be coming, um, what should they argue? Well, what they can point to is the McLaughlin decision that Patrick already talked about. Uh, and try to use that in conjunction with Ilizidi to argue that uh, Kmark actually doesn't hold that you can't estimate fees. What McLaughlin said was that uh, if uh, the debt collector wanted to convey that the amounts in its letter were estimate, estimates, then it could have said so. It did not. And uh, Kmark took that to say in a situation where there was no demarcation between incurred and estimated fees that you, you had a potential FDCPA violation. However, if you have a situation where you do have a demarcation between estimate and non-estimated fees like you do in Ilizidi, you have an argument in the third that uh, Kmark doesn't speak to it. Ilizidi is uh, persuasive when you look at it in conjunction with what the third has already said in the McLaughlin case. An excellent point. I, 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 I have to agree um, wholeheartedly, not only because you're a partner, but because you're right. Um, but I think that I think that that's the that's the important distinction here um, between Elizidi and Kmark is that when you compare Elizidi to Kmark, uh, under just the Kmark decision, I don't think you get a pass with even uh, the estimated fees. But when you pull back in the McLaughlin decision, which also was a Third Circuit decision, right? You're, right. you're getting through that by saying, well, you know what? Uh, Kmark was talking in that context about why the statement made in the complaint, which made no reference to estimated fees, failed, but it didn't foreclose the ability to 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 communicate uh, uh, the estimated fees to the debtor, as McLaughlin noted, can be done. And then certainly you can appoint to Elizidi and that the materiality uh, issues concerning the accuracy of the amounts is not as great when we're making certain that the debtor, it's communicated clearly to the debtor that these are estimates. And I think the other, of course, the other problem, issue with Elizidi, it's a great case, El, I mean, you have to love Elizidi, is that it didn't, uh, uh, the contract wasn't as um, firm on the issue of estimates uh, as, uh, as, as others could be, 
Um, but I think that's, of course, a tremendous help to anyone practicing in the Fourth Circuit. Uh, I, I do think the combination, though, of Elazidi and uh, McLaughlin should help in uh, a Kmart defense uh, where you used um, estimated fees. Before we get too further, though, I think it's important that we, we touch on um, that, th that these cases, of course, are addressing only situations where the communication is coming from a debt collector. Um, if you're a mortgage servicer and you're not a debt collector under the FDCPA, uh, you don't have these kinds of concerns because they're, this is purely uh, an interpretation of the FDCPA. And, and not all mortgage servicers are debt collectors and, and are not always acting as debt collectors. And so the, the, the limitation here is, is purely to when the mortgage servicer is acting subject to the FDCPA. Good. Uh, we have anything else to add on the Elizidi, uh, Kmark, um, McLaughlin trio of cases here before we move on? I think we've covered it. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Then what we're going to do is we're going to shoot over to uh, Patrick. And Patrick, why don't you uh, take us through some early communications that can prove problematic in light of Kmart? Thanks, Don. Uh, now, in the mortgage servicing context, uh, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act and the Truth in Lending Act both mandate certain early disclosures to a borrower. Um, TILA requires notification to a borrower, borrower within 30 days of any transfer of loan ownership. And RESPA requires notification of the borrower within 15 days prior to a transfer of servicing of the loan uh, by the transferring servicer and within 15 days of transferring servicing of the loan by the new servicer of the loan. Now these communications could pose FDCPA problems if they attempt to collect a debt. Um, now taking a look and drilling down into the requirements uh, for disclosure when there is a transfer of ownership of the loan, um, the disclosure must identify the loan sold, uh, identify the date of the transfer, um, identify the authorized party on behalf of the new loan owner who can receive notices and resolve any issues uh, concerning payments. Uh, must notify the borrower whether or not the uh, transfer will be recorded publicly, uh, whether or not there are any partial payment policies, for instance, if uh, payment is made for less than the uh, full amount um, of the uh, monthly payment owed, um, will it be held in a suspense account, um, what any other partial payment policies might be, and any other information that the uh, disclosing party wishes to make. Um, now this can be problematic because sometimes a disclosure may identify the loan by using the balance of the amount owed. Um, and that could cause, pose problems if estimated fees were included in that amount uh, for the same reasons in the Kmart decision. Um, with respect to servicing transfers, uh, those transfers require uh, notification that the date on which the servicing transfer will be completed, um, any contact information for the transferring servicer, contact information for the new servicer, uh, the date when payment acceptance uh, switches from the old servicer to the new servicer, and any effect that the servicing transfer may have on certain insurance policies, um, such as mortgage life or disability insurance and what steps the borrower may need to keep those policies in place. Now, if any of these communications state the amount of the debt, then the disclosing party should use the Miller language and comply with G of the FDCPA. Um, Section 1692G requires an initial communication in a connection with the collection of any debt 
the debt collector must disclose the amount of the debt, uh, the name of the creditor, um, a statement that uh, the consumer can within 30 days dispute the validity of the debt, at which point the debt collector will um, must um, provide verification of the debt, and that um, the consumer could request within the 30-day period that the debt collector provide the name and address of the original creditor of the loan. Now what's key here is the amount of the debt. In a 1692G notice, the debt collector must use the Miller language and avoid any type of um, statement of any estimated fees, um, which is important or else there could be a violation of section 1692G. Well, I think the, the, the real issue here, uh, Patrick, is always going to be the amount of the debt when we have multiple um, elements of that debt that are changing over time. And that's what we're seeing. That's, of course, uh, was the problem in Kmart was that we were running right into that with the uh, estimate. And we see it constantly with interest um, uh, in, in, in various lawsuits where uh, the, the, any letter doesn't indicate that interest is accruing. We'll see a suit there. But uh, to back up a second here, I want to go back to these, 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 three, uh, these three points and talk about... Um, uh, where we're seeing amount of the debt. Now, I think you mentioned uh, that we're going to see it, or we sometimes see it in this uh, in this situation here, with uh, the uh, loan, uh, the transfer of loan ownership. Uh, correct. That's correct, but it's not necessary to identify the amount of the debt in a um, notice of transfer of but loan it ownership. Happens. It sometimes happens, but it, it's not necessary, and why take the risk if it's not required? Well, exactly. So so if it's not required and you have estimates uh, of fees or, uh, or, or costs and you're accruing interest, uh, I guess you could get away with it not saying an amount at all. And what's nice about that in the FDCPA context, if you're not required to identify the amount, right, uh, right. Then don't they don't identify it. numbers. Numbers are danger in FDCPA litigation because numbers are subject to inaccuracies. And we saw in Kmart the court um, the court pointing out that imprecise numbers, or at least allow a claim. Yeah, you know it's important, guys, in Kmart to note that there was just a reversal and it was remanded. So Kmart may ultimately end up favorably uh, to. Uh, the um, foreclosure attorney on some points. I think the estimated fees is going to be a hard one to overcome, but possibly on other points there, um, they could prevail. Um, but, you know, see, the I think the, the, the problem is, is that when you're giving this 30-day uh, uh, transfer uh, of loan ownership notice, this may be your initial communication with the consumer, right? So that's where you're getting into the 1692G A disclosures that we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, correct. That's correct. So, you, what what are the thoughts there, gentlemen, about breaking these out? I mean, do you want to throw them all into one notice? Do 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 you see that often where they're put into one notice, or 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 do you think it's a better practice to break out your G notice uh, from uh, your transfer notice? Well, sometimes when the loan servicing transfer um, notice is made, uh, the notice, if it's a joint notice or if it is the notice provided by the new servicer of the loan, um, the new servicer will oftentimes be uh, notice. And that's fine as long as the Miller language is used um, if the loan is, is in default on transfer. Yep, and as long as you're accruing interest or 
You've got some fees that are going to be built in later. You know, certainly the Miller language is, is great for that. You know, uh, not to say, though, that you always must use the Miller language or that um, you're going to be liable if you don't use the Miller language. Uh, you can use variants of the Miller language that still convey uh, clearly to the consumer that there are, uh, these are estimates and that there are additional amounts that are going to accrue. But the key to remember with when you're going to use the Miller language is that when you state the amount of the debt, it is accurate at the time that it is stated. Um, because even if you use the Miller language and you blow the amount of the debt, you're still looking at problems. So 1692GA uh, is certainly a requirement uh, of, uh, in, in any um, uh, collection process. Um, you know, we talked about it earlier about uh, it has to be given within five days of the initial communication. Um, so you got to be mindful if the transfer notice is an initial communication. Uh, it is certainly a communication to the debtor, uh, read and construed broadly. Uh, it would be in connection with the collection of a debt. I think it could be arguable in some places that it's not, but why argue it when you could simply um, have a good compliance model in effect? And that it must include all of these different elements. Now, this is this is basic FDCPA. But, of course, uh, the amount of the debt is where we're getting into problems with the transfer notices. So um, when we don't have to use the transfer notices, it sounds like, uh, sorry, to use an amount in a transfer notice it sounds like uh, we want to avoid that well we've got we've got some more issues here with other communications that are made by servicers where we could get a kmark problem and the next one i think that uh, we're going to look at uh, i believe ernest is going to talk about requests for payoff statements yeah thanks don uh when we're dealing with payoff statement requests uh, servicers must provide uh, a payoff statement within uh, seven days for ordinary mortgages and uh, five days for HCL mortgages. Now, the statement must provide an accurate statement of the total outstanding balance that would be required to pay the consumer's obligation in full as of a specified date. Now, the key word there, Don, is specified. And the reason is it does not require any particular date, only that you give a statement as of a specified date. And so there's really no good reason why specified shouldn't be the date that you're providing the accurate statement as opposed to estimating uh, any future charges or providing a statement uh, of what you believe uh, the total outstanding balance would be on any future Date. Now, of course, if for some reason you would like to provide an accurate statement that's uh, good on a future date, uh, you need to use the Miller Safe Harbor language or find a very good attorney. Sure. Now, of course you do. Um, so here, I mean, you know, when when I started practicing, I had, I had also... Um, worked on a few foreclosure cases in my time. And, you know, I always would see uh, the payoff statement come, and it was always a future date payoff statement. Um, I know that the regulation has changed a lot since the late 80s and early 90s uh, today. But, uh, I mean, th there, there's a pretty big danger now, certainly in light of Kmark, of if you have a closing, let's say today is July 9th, that's going to occur on August 30 to provide a statement of what the amount is on August 30. Uh, you think that's a problem? Well, you're, you're taking a huge risk there yeah. um, because uh, if, if anything happens between uh, July 9 and August 30, then uh, you run the risk that your statement's not accurate. For example, it could be certain title charges or, or whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. It changes the total outstanding balance. If anything changes the total outstanding balance, you run the risk that your statement wasn't accurate. Yeah, I think, I think there may be a way of uh, like incorporating a Miller-type disclosure into that, that this amount may change as a result of payments or credits uh, that you may receive. Uh, or that we may receive, I'm sorry, in um, 
um, between now and, and, and again. But you're right. I mean, the, the, the amount of the debt um, has to be accurate at the time it's made. Uh, when you, when you're sneaking in, uh, not sneaking, I don't want to use that word, when you're incorporating in estimates um, of sums that have not yet been incurred or for services that have not yet been performed, right back into the KMARC uh, uh, dilemma. So request for payoff statements, guys, uh, clearly another area of concern. So, yeah, there, there's more. There's always more when we talk about the FDCPA and potential liability. And I guess the other area where that's going to arise, Patrick, is with offers to reinstate the mortgage, huh? Absolutely. Now, the standard Fannie Mae mortgage uh, uses a broader provision for reinstatements than it uses for um, authorizing amounts that can be collected um, in sections nine or uh, nine or sections nine or twenty two of the mortgage. Uh, section nineteen, uh, this broader provision requires the borrower to take a series of actions before the loan is reinstated. Uh, those actions include paying all sums owed as if no acceleration had occurred, correcting any defaults with the mortgage's covenants, uh, for instance, any local code compliance issues, paying all were incurred in enforcing the mortgage, and also to take other actions to assure the lender that all payments under the mortgage are made and that the lender's interests and rights remain protected. And that broader language could authorize um, the lender to collect fees um, that it estimates would be owed, especially if the reinstatement amount is good through a future date. Now, I, I say could. There might be some opening up for liability there, and it is advisable, I think, to use the Miller language in, in that instance and maybe not to provide a lengthy period of time in which the reinstatement amount can be made. Um, but there was a case um, recently, or not, not so recently, back in 2005, that dealt with this very issue um, in Massachusetts. And that's called the uh, Petway case, um, or Petway and Hubbard versus Harmon Law Offices. And in Petway, two borrowers contacted the foreclosure attorneys to obtain reinstatement amounts. The foreclosure attorneys asked the borrowers when they wanted to make the reinstatement payments or when they could make the reinstatement payments. Now, based upon the dates provided by the borrowers, the foreclosure attorneys included fees and costs in the reinstatement amount that would be incurred through the date requested by the borrowers and included in a footnote to the reinstatement amounts it explained that the amount included estimated charges that had not been incurred as the date of the letter but were estimated to be incurred through the date that the borrowers requested the reinstatement payments to be made. The borrowers sued the foreclosure attorneys for violations of the FDCPA and both the foreclosure attorney and the borrower moved for summary judgment. Now what happened was interesting because the district court denied both motions for summary judgment and the district court held that on the one hand with respect to the borrower's motion for summary judgment it held that whether or not the practice of even lumping together on accrued with accrued costs was a misleading representation was a issue of disputed fact um, and with respect to the foreclosure attorney's motion for summary judgment the district court held that the whether or not the footnote was sufficient to make clear to a debtor that the lump sum requested for reinstatement included both accrued and unaccrued charges was also an issue of fact. Um, now if we could just go back one slide and take a look at that footnote. 
it's it states that you know the the quoted legal fees and costs are estimated. Now, it's pretty ambiguous uh, when you. Um, right, the uh, quoted legal fees and costs here. You know, are are all of the legal fees and costs estimated? Were any incurred? Um, you know, how much was incurred? It, it's very unclear. Um, so in light of the Kmart decision, I'm, I'm not sure how this would play out in the Third Circuit. Uh, not well, <laughs> I think. I think I think not well. I think that, that, you know, I mentioned before kind of like a modified Miller. I think that's where this footnote was going. But there's problems with it. The first problem with it is it's a footnote. Um, uh, so a footnote probably uh, would have uh, less um, prominence uh, in the letter. Wouldn't effectively convey uh, that these are estimated fees and costs uh, and wouldn't uh, uh, alert the debtor uh, to, uh, to the fact that uh, uh, the amount may be less uh, at this present time. Um, so I see that as really problematic. Also, I see as problematic, and uh, I know, Ernest, you, you're going to want to jump in on this, so you can jump in, <laughs> is that this, this, this is a very confusing uh, statement to make in a letter. Uh, do you see any confusion here uh, with this statement, Ernest? Yeah, yeah, I do, Don. I mean, this statement is misleading on its face. Uh, you know, it, it, it references the quoted legal fees and costs above, which, you know, one would think are, are accurate. And, and then it goes on to say they're estimated, right. uh, which suggests they're not. Mm -hmm. and, but then it also implies uh, estimated through the date in the future. Uh, it, it's just completely confusing. Uh, don't use this language. I know we're not here to give legal advice, but don't use this language, yeah, please. Well. Yeah, uh, yeah, not that wasn't legal advice. That was in the hypothetical where where you're sending <laughs> off a request for reinstatement. Hypothetically, this is really bad legal advice to use. And I think you know, in the last slide here on this case, where we look at these uh, uh, this uh, whether the borrower, I'm sorry, whether the practice of lumping accru uh, unaccrued and accrued costs constitutes a misleading representation is an issue of disputed fact. I mean, you know, that's a punt by the court. Uh, this is FDCPA. Uh, the standard is the least sophisticated uh, debtor. I think that uh, uh, I think that the court uh, certainly could have ruled on that. And then they punt, of course, um, on the last part as well. But I guess I guess uh, the lesson learned here was uh, that the court was probably trying to persuade the parties to settle. Um, because it, it, it was probably going to make a very hard decision. And I don't think that that decision would have been favorable to the firm here. And, and it points out in this last part here, right, the last part is that whether the footnote is sufficient uh, to make clear that the lump sum demand includes both accrued and unaccrued charges. I think the letter could have, could have passed muster if it, you know, all you hear here today, right, is Miller, 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 Miller. Well, yeah, when you're doing estimates and things like that, you, you want to uh, address these questions, these concerns about making it clear. Um, I think that um, it could have said, uh, 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 referenced the amount due today and noted that the amount may increase based on uh, the addition of fees, uh, charges, interests, and other costs that are permitted by the contract. You know, please call um, to get uh, the amount due uh, as of the date that you want to make your payment. The problem with all this, though, guys, in the mortgage context, before 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 we leave, is that you you you're you're asking for a payoff, right? And you're the borrower. You call in and. You, you're the lender and you say, okay, I'll give you the amount as of today, but the borrower needs the amount as of tomorrow <laughs> because they're not, if you're in California and the borrower is in Massachusetts and you don't have an office in Massachusetts, that payment may not be made until the next day. 
I think that there's going to have to be some latitude because operationally this is almost impossible unless that payment can be received through uh, wire transfer on the same day. And I, I could see some people in light of Kmart requiring that. It's like, look, I can just give you a payoff as of today. This is the amount as of today. Um, any thoughts on that, guys? Well, it's certainly going to present some challenges, Don. And I think, you know, it wouldn't surprise me, at least in, in the third, if as a safe route forward, you see servicers only providing uh, payoff statements uh, as of the day they're, they're giving the statement. Right. And essentially, you know, saying, you know, we'll do it on the day of closing. Right. You know, and, 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 and why expose, you know, ourselves to, to, to risk? Now, I'm not saying everyone's going to do it that way, but uh, it's certainly the safest way. Yeah, I think something, uh, something along those lines is probably going to have to be done. Uh, now, also, um, before we leave, yeah. I think it's uh, important to mention that we've talked a lot about Kmart in the Third Circuit, but... The Kmart type claim is not limited to the Third Circuit, uh, guys. You've seen it elsewhere, haven't you? Yeah, uh, we we have seen it in other parts of the country, and particularly in the Eleventh, uh, we've seen cases like this, and and there's the fights going on all over, and and there's probably going to be, I'm sure. Uh, in the not too distant future, some more rulings on this issue. Uh, so as of right now, it's certainly nationwide an open argument. If you're outside of the third or the fourth, uh, how this should uh, be interpreted. Uh, but again, in the third, K marks the law. Yep. So I think and I'm not so. Go ahead, Patrick. I was, please. I was just going to say that I'm not so sure this is better for the consumer or the debtor. Um, if a decision like Kmart is going to force uh, the lender to essentially button up and state that, well, we'll give you the, the reinstatement um, amount for today, but not for the future. It, you know, it, it, that can make it more difficult for the borrower to plan ahead, say I have this amount that I can, if I can get this amount within 30 days or so, um, that actually might be beneficial to the borrower. And uh, I'm not sure the yeah, outcome of the Kmart decision is is um, is going to be beneficial. Absolutely, um, it certainly can slow up the process, make it more difficult. Uh, but uh, you know, um, it's 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 hard to fight with the Third Circuit when you're in the Third Circuit, right? So you have no choice often but to comply. Uh, so we have uh, some upcoming presentation. I think an interesting one for everyone out there that uh, does credit reporting. Uh, we've seen a lot on this over the years, credit reporting during and after bankruptcy on August 19 at 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Uh, you can go to the blog uh, and uh, check out there the registration. Uh, we do not have time to answer questions now, but uh, email us and uh, Patrick, uh, Ernest, or I will get back to you very soon. With, uh, with the answers where we can answer. I appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, thoroughly enjoyed uh, the opportunity to uh, speak with uh, my colleagues, uh, Ernest Wagner and Patrick Tira. Uh, gentlemen, any parting remarks? Thank you very much for joining us today, everyone. Thank you very much.